Hi, I'm Davey. I'm awesome. And welcome to Davey's Awesome Movies, where I review the styles of movies that I love. The alternative, B-rated, cult-style flicks. And this movie is definitely alternative. It is definitely B-rated. And it is definitely a cult flick. This movie was released in 1988. And it was written and directed by Frank Hennen Lauder. And produced by Edgar Ivins. Made by the Brain Damage Company and distributed by Palisades Partners. Ladies and gentlemen, Frank Hennen Lauder's second movie after Basket Case. Brain Damage. The movie opens with a couple, Morris and Martha. Morris has just gotten home after finding a deli that sells fresh animal brains. Some of you are already like, Ew. But hey, mix them with some scrambled eggs. It'll be fine. Oh my god. However, those animal brains are not for them. They are for what appears to be some kind of a pet. Their pet, Elmer. But not spelled like Elmer, spelled like that. But when Martha goes to feed Elmer... God! Oh my gosh! God! Women and their pets. Morris and Martha are both frantically searching for their pet Elmer. And as at this point, we're wondering, what kind of a pet is this? A snake? An iguana? A ferret? Fish? <laughs> Well, you're not gonna find Elmer just sitting there screaming. They go across the hall and ask the neighbor if they can search in her bathtub. My bathtub? Yes, please. Hey! Beverly Bonner's bathtub. Making this her official appearance in a Frank Hannon Lauder movie. Which she did. She had a small part in every Frank Hannon Lauder movie until her death in 2020. Rest in peace, Beverly Bonner. Come on, what's he doing? What the hell is going on? Oh, sorry. And that's it. Like I said, it was always a small part. Her biggest part was in the first Basket Case movie where she made a few appearances. Most movies, she has one scene. Then we go to another apartment in the building shared by two brothers, Mike and Brian. Brian's girlfriend Barbara is there because he's supposed to take her to a concert that night. But suddenly he isn't feeling very well. Even he doesn't understand why but feels like he just needs some rest. And he asks Mike to take Barbara for him. You sure you'll be okay? I just need some sleep. I'm gonna be fine. Brian is played by Rick Hurst. Which, I did not know this until I was researching this movie. Because even though I'd seen it a few times, but apparently, he's a little bit famous. Like, he didn't do a lot of movies after this, but apparently he's had big parts in just about every freaking daytime soap opera there ever was. Then we go back to Morris and Martha, who look like they took some Alka-Seltzer to help with the stress. Their tummies must have been hurting over them missing their Elmer. A little bit later, though, Brian wakes up. He's feeling a little bit better, except for the fact that he's got mysterious blood in his bed, coming from the back of his neck. I mean, I got nothing to explain that, except some really intense dreams, maybe. Is this a Freddy movie? No, 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 no. Too low budget. And while he's still trying to figure out what happened, he's also still a little weak and woozy. And of course, this is the moment somebody wants to take his picture. He goes back to lay down on his bed and starts seeing... His toilet has overflowed! Don't just lie there, get a plumber! Later he snaps out of it and realizes all that blue water stuff was just a hallucination. But not the back of the neck, that was real. Brian, though, figures somebody is here, and he starts yelling out and he demands to know who is there. Hi! That's a blue penis! Ew. That creature is Elmer. Voiced by John Zacherly. Who apparently was not terribly famous, but pretty well-known horror movie host. He had television shows throughout the country, never syndicated, but, but basically where he hosted the B-rated exploitation horror movies like this. Kind of like Elvira, Mistress of the Dark, or something like that. He did the honors of being Elmer. And this talking little creature, they never say exactly what he is, is telling Brian that he's going to give him a new life without pain and worry. A life filled instead with colors and music and euphoria. Kill it with fire. Elmer wants Brian to take him outside for a walk. In return, tells Brian, put him on his neck 
and he is going to give him a feeling of euphoria. Trust me, Brian. Trust me. To trust that creepy thing, you'd have to be stupid. Brian is stupid. Elmer is able to excrete a blue liquid directly onto Brian's brain. That gives him a euphoric high, also makes him hallucinate. Basically, it's like drugs, but looks like Drano. Brian goes around hallucinating on this new drug, basically seeing lights and colors and other things, ends up in a junkyard. And this gets the attention of the junkyard's night watchman. A night watchman who apparently takes his job very, very seriously. Like, he pulls out a gun, which is right off at the back, kind of weird. They're not really worried about that kind of theft at a junkyard. It's more like a security guard's there just to be a scarecrow. Plus, to pull a gun on a kid who's unarmed, just clearly high. Seems like this is just a guy who really wanted to be a cop, but couldn't pass the exam. But, as he's searching Brian... <laughs> I don't think Elmer is getting him high like he did for Brian. In fact, Brian is so high he doesn't really get what's going on. What's going on? What are you what are you doing? Is he okay? He's fine. We fast forward a few days and Barbara comes over because she's getting really worried about Brian. And then again, so is Mike. He's been in the bathtub for the last three hours. Gross. If you were in the bathtub that long, by that point most of that water would just be your pee. Mike tells Barbara how Brian is not doing anything right now. He doesn't go to work or even leave the apartment at all. He spends all day either in his room or in the bathtub. Yet he's put several bolt locks on both his bedroom and bathroom doors. So there's a hole in your story, Mike. Obviously he left to go get the bolt locks. Barbara goes to knock on the bathroom door to ask Brian if he is ready for their date. Women. I'm just saying. Obviously something's wrong here, and all you're thinking about is your free dinner. <laughs> That's not terribly weird. I scream like that in the tub when I find my rubber ducky. Barbara and Brian go to dinner, and Brian is trying to explain to Barbara what's going on. You're on drugs, right? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing that simple. Actually, it is that simple. Barbara wants more of an explanation than what Brian is given, mainly because... She can't understand a freaking thing he's saying. Then again, when you watch this, even though you've been following the whole story, you're not getting it either. But Brian tells her he can't tell her. I think I should explain it right now. Why not? It won't let me. It won't even let him eat his spaghetti and meatballs. Calm down, Brian. I, I, I gotta go. Go! I mean, if he's leaving, I call dibs on the spaghetti. Brian goes into an alley where Elmer gets him high. And then he stumbles into a nightclub. Beautiful! <laughs> if that's a turn on, ladies, then you really need to go home and take a good look at yourself. But instead of going home and reevaluating her life, she takes Brian out back. Feels like you got a real monster in there. <laughs> well, that's one way to put it. As she goes to. You know. Well. <laughs> Apparently during this scene, the entire crew left, refused to work on this scene. And I can understand why. I'm gonna skip to the end of the scene. <laughs> Brian's pants are ruined. Brian snaps out of it, realizes there's a girl on the floor, looks like she's dead, doesn't know who she is or where she came from, so he just goes back into the club to leave. And if that girl would have obeyed that sign, she'd still have her brains. Ah, what does it matter? She didn't use them. Brian goes back to his apartment, not inside, just in an alley outside the apartment, to check his underwear of all things. He feels something weird. He realizes there is blood on his underwear that is not his. And then he hears a voice. You fool! You're feeding him human brains! It's Morris. Morris tells Brian that Elmer is going to drug him and use him up until he is worthless and dead. So Brian asks if that's true, then why does Morris want him? Because he's mine! Elmer belongs to me! So it's like a junkie saying, say no to drugs! And give them to me. Morris even explains Elmer's name. 
It means the all-inspiring famous one. For the Aylmer is a creature of endless histories. This guy really wants his fix. Morris then explains Elmer's origin from the 1400s and how he just kept getting passed from person to person until that person would die, none of them dying by old age or anything, until he actually got to America, which is when Morris bought him. As he's telling him this, Brian runs off. Run! 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 Mine, 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 mine. When Brian gets up to his apartment, Mike is there and wants to know what is going on with him. He also wants to know what's going on with him and Barbara. Mind your place, Mike. But Brian says he doesn't have time for this. He has to leave for a few days because he has to get control of this. Could you try making sense for just a couple of minutes, please? If he did that, then we wouldn't have a movie. But Brian says he needs to leave now. And go where? General Hospital. Just one of the many soap operas Rick Hurst would go to. Like seriously, researching this, found that out. If you're asking like which daytime soap operas he was on, pick one. Brian then goes to a creepy, seedy-like motel, and he asks Elmer about Morris. Kept me weak by feeding me animal brains while they drained me like two shriveled parasites. So Brian, maybe you should go get him some animal brains. Brian now knows that he's been aiding and killing people, and he wants no part of it. He tells Elmer he will not do this anymore. You're mine now, Brian. I own you. Brian says he's done. He's not going to take any more of Elmer's drugs. And Elmer says... We'll see about that. Even promises he's not going to bite him in his sleep or nothing. Because he wants to prove a point. I don't get a brain, you don't get my juice. We'll just see who cracks first. So the battle of wits has begun! Which I'm not betting on Brian. He doesn't look too good at wits. As time goes on, Brian is going through some very heavy withdrawals and very badly hallucinating. But the hallucinations aren't the fun ones he had before. They're horror hallucinations. And of course, Elmer's enjoying this. He's even taunting Brian. But whenever you want the pain to stop, I'll be here. Spoken like a true dealer. Eventually, Brian can't help it anymore, and he asks for Elmer's help. I'll be happy to help you, but you'll have to feed me first. So Brian, if you're going to give in, take this opportunity and exclusively feed him morons. So not only is this hotel seedy, but it's a hotel that I would never want to stay at as the bathrooms and showers are communal. No thanks. So Brian goes down to the showers and finds someone. What's your problem, man? Huh? Uh, he's at this hotel that doesn't even offer a private shower. That's his problem. Oh, yours. Yeah, if that pale weirdo was staring at me like that in the shower, I'd probably be like, you know what, I'm done. Instead of the guy in the shower, Elmer goes over to some guy in a toilet. Which means this whole scene of us having to see the butt of some roided up Mexican with a porno mustache was for nothing. <laughs> Not to pile on the bad news here, dude, but you're also out of toilet paper. Oh, there it is. Well, at least that's one problem solved. Brian, having given up and probably wanting to take a shower in private, goes home. And once he gets home, Mike and Barbara come in. They've been looking for Brian. I can't deal with being dumped like this. So you can bite in his brother. Good woman. So with Brian literally in the other room, Barbara and Mike start going at it. That is like his very recent ex. I get he dumped her, but you're his brother. Come on. Brian hearing this decides to zone it out by getting some juice onto his brain. And then he starts hallucinating. And his hallucinations take him to a dream of him joining Barbara and his brother. That's just nasty. But then, his hallucination changes from having a threesome with the two of them to him eating Barbara's brains. So that's still nasty, but at least not as nasty. When Brian finally comes to, he tells Mike and Barbara that they need to leave. Not because he's upset or jealous or anything, he honestly doesn't care about them being together. He tells him he wants them to leave because he can't cope with the killings, that's why he has to get high so he doesn't know what's going on. And he's worried that if they stay around, they're gonna die too. But that's exactly how he explains it. So they have no idea what the hell he's talking about. I don't want it to be you. So explain it better and maybe they will understand and leave. But he leaves to give him time to go and Barbara goes after him. One brain's as good as the next! 
explain that to her. Barbara doesn't leave, though. She keeps following him, even after he goes to the subway, gets high, and gets on a train. She watches us all from a distance. She even gets on the subway with Brian and sits down right next to him. And then we see that on the train, there's a... Well, a real basket case. Yes, Kevin Van Hetten Rick makes a cameo in this movie as Dwayne Bradley with the basket case. Which means the movies are connected, but it doesn't say what point this was supposed to take place. Like, was this during basket case? Or was this on his way to New York right before basket case took place? I'm guessing it's not supposed to take place after Basket Case because originally Funny Candelotter wasn't going to do a sequel to Basket Case. And when people would ask him about it, he would say, well, they died at the end of the movie. He later wrote around that. So my guess is this is supposed to be Dwayne and Belial on their way to New York. And then after the brain damage movie comes Basket Case. Either way, that's just kind of cool. Brian must think so too because he can't stop staring at the Basket Case. Disintegrate. Brian... You're telling me you're going to kill someone, and you don't even- How creepy are you that even Dwayne can't be around you? Barbara, still being conflicted, still trying to talk to Brian even though he's clearly not there, gives him a kiss. <laughs> Should have listened to Brian and stayed home with Mike. Of course, Brian has no idea what is going on right now, so Elmer just finishes eating Barbara's brains, and then they lay her down and innocently walk out of the subway. When Brian returns home... We want him back! Yes, Brian. Give Elmer back, and then go to a methadone clinic. But as they go to take Elmer... <laughs> they should have expected that. Morris tries pulling Elmer off of Martha, but he can't. You have a gun, you could try shooting it. But you know, then if it kills him, he won't get his fix. So once Elmer is done with Martha... Naturally. Brian has snapped out of it, so this is actually making him sick. Put me on your neck. Hurry up. But right after he attaches Elmer to his neck... Yeah, okay. Morris grabs Elmer while he's attached to Brian's neck, and it causes... Elmer to secrete more than just a little bit of that juice. In fact, he is pouring that juice all over his brain like crazy. And if you didn't notice earlier, when it comes to this juice on the brain, little dab will do ya. Morris finally gets Elmer off of him, but apparently this much juice coming out of Elmer getting all over himself is not good for him either, as Elmer lays there and we imagine he dies. And so does Morris. Brian, in a ton of pain, rushes upstairs with that gun to shoot himself in the head. <laughs> Not what we or Brian expected. Brian! It's electrifying! So there you have it. That's the 1988 classic cult flick brain damage. It took six years for Frank Handelotter to finally do another movie, and this is what came out. It wasn't a theatrical success, as it only had a very limited run. As far as its budget, Frank Handelotter, like Basket Case, was just getting it whatever funding he could from wherever he could, and said that the budget was just under $2 million, which was still way more than Basket Case, but doesn't remember exactly how much it all cost him. Again, it didn't do very well in its limited theatrical run, but... Apparently, it did do very well once it got to video. During its theatrical run, nobody really wanted brain damage. They wanted a sequel to Basket Case. Frank Henelotter was still adamant that he wasn't going to do one, wanted to do something different, and this is what came about. So he did say that most of the fans were like, no, we want Basket Case and nothing else. But some of the other fans finally went like, you know what, let's give it a shot. And me personally, I didn't care if this was like Basket Case or not. It was just a good, crazy story, like Frank Henelotter does. Although I did love the basket case nod to it. This movie, though, was inspired by Frank Henelotter's past cocaine addiction. However, he insists that this movie was neither pro or anti-drug, but really just a monster movie, which was some of the controversy about it. Some people felt that this was promoting drugs and sexuality. 
I don't get how they thought that. Even Frank Henlotter said, if it was promoting it, then Brian wouldn't have lost everything at the end of it. But again, it wasn't like some moral story trying to detour you from drugs. Although it kind of was. Ultimately, I gotta agree with Frank Henlotter on that. All I got out of it was it was just a monster movie. But according to Frank Henlotter, it was also inspired by The Legend of Faust. The thing about this, though, is the theatrical and original home video release of this movie did actually have a lot of the gore and stuff cut out, and then it got put back in for the 2007 DVD release. It took till 2007 to get this on DVD. But then again, in Frank Henlotter's first run of this movie, it was actually only 66 minutes long, and he had to add some of that gore stuff back just to get it to be a decent length movie. Although apparently until the 2007 DVD, which I never saw before that, but the scene of the girl who got Elmer in her mouth was cut way down until it was released on DVD. The voice of Elmer, though, done by John Zachary, had to actually be added in post-production because the little mechanical puppet they had as Elmer was just way too loud for them to try and do it during filming. Originally, New Line Cinema was going to distribute this movie, but then after a screening, some of the partners at New Line Cinema said, no, let's pass on this. Me personally, thinking about, like, you know, 80s New Line Cinema kind of would have been perfect for them. The original name that Frank Hanlotter gave this movie when he wrote the script was Elmer the Parasite. He later changed it to Brain Damage. I'm going to say good change. It was also Rick Hurst's film debut. He'd done little stuff before this, and then, like I said, after this, apparently he went on to be in just about every freaking soap opera that ever existed. But this was his first claim to fame. Although one interesting story is the split in his lip throughout the movie. It never gets explained in the movie. The reason Frank Hanenlotter did the makeup effects for the split lip on Brian was he felt that Rick Hurst was just too pretty. He needed it taken down a little bit. And apparently there were scenes that they were going to film to explain what happened to his split lip. Something about him getting into a bar fight defending his brother Mike, which would have also shown the closeness of him and Mike besides just being brothers. But they didn't have the money to film it, so they just left it out of there and we now wonder why this guy has a permanently split lip. But whatever. But the thing about it is this movie was incredibly low budget. So low budget that all the sets around there, whenever they got them, they had to film everything they needed with that set right away. Because as soon as they were done with the sets, they all got destroyed. Most movies don't do that. Most movies, they have sets, they film some, they go over here, they film some more, they come back and they film. They couldn't do that. So everything in Brian's apartment was shot back to back. Everything in that hotel was shot back to back. They only had limited times with each set. But you know what? It came out well. Because ultimately, yes, this movie's nuts. It's crazy. It's definitely an exploitation film. But it's original and it's fun. And it's a good straight up monster movie. So on that note, if you have not seen Brain Damage, then I do recommend you go out and see Brain Damage. So there you have it. That's my movie review this week. I hope you guys enjoyed it. And if you did... Make sure to hit like, hit subscribe, hit the little bell so you get notifications when I post new videos, and leave a comment. Tell me what you thought of Brain Damage. Tell me which of the Frank Hanelotter movies is your favorite. Love you guys.